Hello, and welcome to the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible, but were afraid to ask. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Katie Langston. Uh, and today on the podcast, we are delighted to be joined by a very special guest, a returning guest, Jennifer Kalin, wow. who is Associate Professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And um, we had a, a pretty challenging question come in and we thought, well, Jennifer is so bright and wise <laughs> that she's the one we must we must bring on for this. So thank you so much for being here with us, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. So the question uh, comes from a listener and um, uh, just a reminder that if you have questions um, uh, about the Bible that you would like to hear us address on the podcast, you can go to the website at enterthebible.org and um, ask a question. We get to as many of these as we can. So this was a fairly long question, so I'm going to summarize it uh, for the most part, but it comes from a member of the LGBTQ community who says that, um, that they've been going back and forth between uh, being atheist and Christian for a few years. And on the one hand, um, you know, she says that her community um, is ridicules her for following Jesus, um, uh, but she feels... Um, more peaceful and calm and not as angry when she is following Jesus. But then on the other hand, uh, when she encounters uh, cons super, maybe more conservative perspectives on the Bible, um, there's this sense of condemnation and shame. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when she encounters more liberal interpretation, um, her, her takeaway is that, you know, most of the things didn't actually happen, and God is just this sort of, um, you know, this sort of amorphous love presence. <laughs> and so there's just this this tension um, where um, she's not sure what what to do or how to do it, um, and and sort of sums up the question by saying, you know, um, when I actually follow Jesus, I'm more peaceful and calm. But I sometimes feel that that being a, by being a Christian, I'm supporting a book in an organization that hurts people. What do I do? Um, and this is just such a this was such a heartfelt question um, that, um, yeah, I, I really uh, my heart really went out to this uh, to this person who's asking this question. So, yeah, yeah I mean, we were like saying before we before we hopped on, that this is definitely one of those questions where we're going to be doing more of the reflecting than the answering. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. But thank oh. you to the the listener who submitted that question. And we are, uh, yeah, as Katie said, our heart goes out to you. Uh, and hopefully this will be helpful to you. But Jennifer, what? how would you even begin to respond to, to that? Uh, well, thank you for the question and for the wrestling. Right. Because um, I think yeah. it's uh, often easier to re resign to one side or the other of this debate. But um, to continue to wrestle with it, uh, I think, is important. Um, that's the first thing I would say. Um, the other thing that I, I may begin with is that something I say often say to my students, and that is that the Bible itself can be used as a tool or as a weapon. Right. And, and that is for that is to keep us mindful of being ethical in our the ways that we're reading and approaching and talking about the Bible. Um, and we can often stop and ask ourselves when we're interpreting a text, are we using this as a tool to help improve the lives of people? Or are we using this as a weapon um, in, in ways to, uh, you know, uh, kind of demean someone's uh, something about their characteristics, who they are, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's one of the things is, is to being honest about the fact that yes, um, yes, the Bible has hurt people. And yes, churches have the Bible. I shouldn't say that the Bible doesn't hurt people. Um, that's the other thing I, I kind of would say about the question is that the Bible itself um, doesn't hurt people. Um, and, and we are not responsible I think, for uh, supporting the Bible. I don't think the Bible needs our support either um, in, in that way, right? Um, but what the Bible um, does is it can, can do, is it can provide us 
um, with that type of inspiration, right? That the writer or the, the listener is as saying, right? It's like, but, but still there's something in this text, right? That inspires me, that encourages me, that makes me feel loved and supported. That, um, I think, without erasing all the other stuff, right? That is the part that I think is important for us to hold in tension. And isn't that life? This text is reflecting the lived experiences of various time periods, of various contexts, of various voices. And I think that's what's important for us to think about. It's not that you're supporting a book necessarily, right? There are many books in this book. And that means <laughs> like with all the books we read, right? I'm a huge fan of Toni Morrison, but I might not like the work of someone else, right? And so I can support this book. I can support Song of Solomon and say, well, you know, I really didn't like Sula as much, but still enjoy <laughs> right? her entire body of work. And that's the same thing we can do with the Bible in and of itself, right? Is you know, what really resonates with me is the Psalms because I cry out. I am, uh, I feel that supported and loved, right? All of these things in the Psalms exist in my lived experience in my life. And at the same time, there is nothing in Revelation that seems to reflect, <laughs> for example, right? right. Um, our right, world, right, right. Or, right? And so I think the multivocality of the text understanding that it was written for different people at different times in different moments enable us to enter the text in different ways and to not confuse uh, our interpretation with the text itself, to not confuse our experiences in the church with the church, uh, lowercase, kind of the, the church, which means the body, the people, us um, itself, right? And and, uh, you know, I, I find the question encouraging because um, we can be hurt by the church in many different ways. Right. It, it could be it can be, you know, I walk in one Sunday and as a child and I am denied the opportunity to experience the Eucharist. And I don't understand and I don't feel comfortable asking the question. And for years I'm wrestling with what that might mean. And that's a hurt that I've carried with me for because not just that's not necessarily the fault of the church um, as it's kind of as the institution as it's posed here. That could be a very local individual experience um, of the church or with the church. And so um, I would be, you know, I, I don't think it's fair to the institution or to the text for us to wholesalely um, say that we behave in any one manner. Um, because there are multiple churches that can encompass the church and there are multiple books that encompass the Bible. So I would be open to the complexity um, of that um, as I'm answering or thinking about um, these questions. And so the Reverend Dr. James Cone would often say to students, uh, seminary students in his class, um, that you have learned to love Jesus with your hearts but now I'm going to teach you to love Jesus with your mind. And so uh -huh. the intellectual endeavor of, of studying theology, of learning the Bible, uh, is not to be divorced necessarily, right, from the emotional endeavor of what the kind of what it, it invokes in us when we do that, that type of work. Yeah, and just I know our listeners already uh, understand that uh, reference, but from uh, Deuteronomy 6, where uh, the Israel is called to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And that, of course, becomes part of Jesus saying about what the greatest commandment is, right? Love your neighbor as yourself and then love God with heart, soul, and mind. I love that. I think Cohn's exactly right, right? That we, we, we don't check our mind at the door or check our brain at the door, <laughs> Um, right. when we, when we come into church or when we, uh, when we read scripture, right, that, right. that part of loving God with our mind is to, is to use the God given gifts that we have of reason and intellect, um, to, to study, uh, scripture. Yes. And it seems to me that's exactly what the listener is doing, right? It's, yeah. I'm reading things that are making me wonder about this kind of idea of God yeah. as love. And how do I put that into conversation with the experience people are having when they enter into a church? Or I'm reading and I identify in some ways with this idea of God being love, but I don't experience that 
um, in my mm. community when I'm being ridiculed for actually undertaking this endeavor of study. So, uh, mm. so yes, already that that's an intellectual, I think, engagement with with uh, religion, with theology, with the text itself. Yes. I also I, I just want to affirm also what you said. First of all, the wrestling is hugely important, and the the listener is to be commended for that. And that the Bible is not one book; it's a collection of books from different voices from different times, uh, you know, uh, across the centuries. And so if and it's okay that if one text doesn't speak to you or makes you uh, feel shame or or whatever or is violent, um, that it's okay to put that one aside, right? <laughs> and to go to somewhere else that that feeds your spirit, like this. I think you mentioned the Psalms, Jennifer. That uh, yeah, beautiful book of prayers uh, and honest wrestling with God, or uh, or the Gospels, or um, you know, the epistles or um, the Song of Songs or, or whatever. There are, there are different genres. We've talked about that uh, on other episodes of this podcast. And, and it's okay not, it, it, it's okay to have favorite parts of the Bible mm -hmm. and, to, and to leave aside parts that aren't speaking to you. Because there may come a time too in your life when a different, when maybe the book of Revelation does speak to you, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, yeah, it, uh, I'm a, uh, uh, Katie and I are both Lutheran and Martin Luther talked about, um, reading those texts or privileging those texts of scripture that show forth Christ. Um, and so it's kind of, kind of like, you know, yes, it's all scripture. Yes. We, uh, we hold it as God, all of it as God's word, but there are parts that, uh, do an easier job or a clearer job of showing forth Christ. And it's yes. okay to yes. to kind of privilege those parts. Well, I remember, um, so when I, you know, I, I've shared a little bit about my background on this podcast a few times, but um, came from a Mormon background and had a lot of anxiety around the scripture um, in, in the ways that it, it had been used. Um, I like what you said, Jennifer, about how, like, maybe the Bible itself doesn't hurt us, but the way that it's interpreted and used can be very hurtful. Um, so I had a lot of uh, anxiety about it. I hadn't really wanted to even dive into it very much when I went to seminary. And, and I remember, um, Catherine, you said that exact thing to me that, you know, when I was like, oh, no, no, I'm scared. You know, you said it's okay if there's some parts that you like more and some parts that you don't like more right right now, and you can set those aside. Um, I would say though uh, that the the ditch on the other side that the listener identified is then saying, "Well, then you know, none of this, right? I can set aside, uh, disregard like all of it, or it didn't actually. Some of the things didn't actually happen." And, and we've talked a lot about genre and trying to figure out what things are meant to be taken literally, what things are meant to be taken metaphorically, or whatever. But I think that that other ditch to just throw out whatever you don't like is there and sort of leaves you with maybe not much left sometimes in terms of what you're actually holding on to in your faith. Um, and so there's, um, I think there's a way to set it aside without throwing it away forever. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. So that there's a, there's a, I don't, this, and, and and it's not, <laughs> when I was growing up, they told us if we had questions to put them on a shelf and what they meant by that was never think about them and just keep doing what you're doing and stop asking questions, right? So I'm not saying it that way. I'm not saying put it on a shelf so that you don't ask the question and you just pretend like it's not there and move on with your life doing all the things that, you know, that um, you have to do or you're in big trouble. That's not what I mean by that. What I mean by that is you can say, I don't like this text very much. I don't understand it. So uh, I think I think you, you can even say, I think this text is wrong. <laughs> I disagree with this text, right? Like I don't I don't get it. And yet acknowledge that it's in it's in the scripture. It's there and there might, like you were saying, Catherine, there might come a time when you would come back to it from another perspective and you'd be like, oh, 
oh, like I've had those moments, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I can read this differently now. And because I didn't throw it away yes. altogether, it was yes. still there for me to come back to. I, I think um, the point you're making there is so important. I, and I would, I don't think we need to throw any of it away. I, yeah, we've had a lot of redaction of text already <laughs> that we, that I don't think we need to do that. And I'm, I, and you know, I, I would say often I put questions on a parking lot when I don't want to deal with them in the moment and I don't want to lose sure. where we're going. Right. And I was like, we'll come back to the parking lot. Like we can all come back there right. and drive that car Circle later. Back to it. Yes. Right. And I, so I agree with the parking lot idea, but I think more importantly is that we continue to wrestle with the questions, right? Yes. That we continue yep. to acknowledge that it's there because these ancient texts reflect the complexity of the human experience. And so because there is violence, because there are texts that we don't understand why things have happened the way they do in the text, they speak to the lived experience when we don't, when we see violence in our world, when we see humans behaving in ways that we don't quite understand, um, the text can help us make sense, uh, which I think is a, a huge important task of the text in and of itself, right? To help us make sense of the world we're living in, right? It's not perfect. It's not choice. We don't get to pick. Yeah, no, that's that's really important. I I think, um, and I hear you saying this uh, too, that not all the not all the violence in the Bible is actually there uh, commended there, right? In fact, right. most of it is not commended, right? Some of it it's there just because there's violence in human existence, and and the Bible doesn't look at the world through rose colored glasses, so. I, I think of, I'll just give one example in the book of Judges, at the end of the book of Judges, there's this terrible story of a woman who is gang raped and then dismembered. And mm -hmm. and it's just a horrible, horrible story. The narrator, uh, the, the, the biblical author is not saying that's a good thing. The biblical author is saying, look what happens when people don't follow the Torah, don't follow the law of God. This is what happens when when everyone does what is right in their own eyes. So, uh, yeah, nah, the, the, the Bible tells life as it is without necessarily uh, commending that. And in fact, saying, you know, uh, uh, if you follow, if you worship God, if you love your neighbor as yourself, and if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, this is what you should not do, right? I think the other piece of it that that really strikes me about this person's question, though, is the church part, <laughs> you know, um, because it's one thing to to deal with a text that is old and we can ask questions of it or and get mad at it and wrestle with it and all of that. And then it's another thing like dealing with actual human relationships with actual people who either interpret that text in ways that are um, harmful or um, terrifying and who uh, impose on us shame and uh, speak from my own experience, you know, pressure and uh, like anxiety. <laughs> That's what I experienced like in my church experience growing up, you know, and I'm not, I don't want to compare myself to someone in the LGBTQ community because I think that that's sort of a distinct kind of um, pressure and anxiety that those folks uh, experience in the church. And I think it's like, I would want to say, <laughs> I think finding a community where you can feel at peace, where you're not pressured, where there's not like a lot of shame happening all the time where, you know, where the, the, the gospel really is good news, the good news of repentance, the good news of forgiveness, the good news of hope, the good news of, of, of peace and justice, uh, both in our own lives and in the world. Like, um, it's okay to, um, you know, to, to, to choose a community that is, is healthy for you. And it's okay to not go to a community that is not healthy for you. Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about even just family relationships, right. And the difficulty in, in, in sure. the family that we don't get to choose. And 
and how you, you know, wrestle with uh, politics, food choices, right? <laughs> I mean, something <laughs> right. as simple as food choices is, sure, is if sure. someone chooses to become vegetarian or vegan and, you know, it's like, right. what are you doing? This is how we always eat. And why are you making this more difficult, right? All of those, right. all those life choices make us think, how do we live together? How, do, how are we supposed to function together in community? Is it more important that I remember not to put cheese in this dish um, and, and that it will alter the taste? Is it more important that I defend that? Or is it more important that you feel like you're a part of this community, regardless of the choices that you're making? Right. And so, um, and I mean, those are it's almost silly examples <laughs> that, that happen in my own, my own small little family. It's like, you know, what we're choosing to eat. But how do we make people feel a part of this community? And it's not we don't always get it right because we're people. We don't always get right. it perfect. And so th that's the same thing we experience in the church is that we're all wrestling with how to become better individually. But this is what I love about Paul's letters, right? Because that is also about how do we become, how do we live into this as a community? How do we, you know, how, do, how am I supposed to make you feel loved if you don't tell me that I'm doing things that aren't lovely toward you? Um, right. And that is what being the church is. And so that's not, that's a very difficult task. It's not easy. And that's why I said your individual experiences in a particular community may vary. And to your point, and, and you may need to keep trying it until you find that community that loves you enough to remember that you're vegan, that loves you enough to remember <laughs> right. that you don't want you right. to, them to season the greens with the ham, right? Like, <laughs> love you enough to remember that um, in, in some way. So, yeah. Even no, that's I, I, that's actually good. a helpful analogy, I think, Jennifer. And and one that, uh, to, to go to that kind of other ditch uh, uh, that this listener was talking about, right? That the really liberal churches <laughs> or writings just feel kind of wishy-washy. That's not the term that she used, but feel like it's just a vague kind of God is love and there's, and nothing, uh, you know, that, that um, nothing in the Bible really happened. That, that is another problem, right? So find a church that not only welcomes and loves you, but also one that that does challenge you enough to um, to feed you spiritually, right? And right. to feed your intellect and to and to feed your faith, right? That that right. it's not just I'm okay, you're okay, but that talks about real things like like sin and forgiveness and redemption and transformation, and you know that um, I think I think we so uh, unfortunately the church too often falls into ditches, right? <laughs> Uh, either conservative or liberal, and but there are communities that um, that take the Bible seriously, that believe in Jesus, that love Jesus, and and believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, and that also welcome uh, welcome everyone. So uh, the, they, it's possible. It's possible to find those communities, Absolutely. and we pray, we pray that that listener, uh, we pray that you are able to find that community for you. I mean, it can be really hard to find a church like that. You know what I mean? Like, just like name it, especially in, you know, in the sort of polarized time where we're, that we're living in right now, where it seems like, at least in the United States, like our politics <laughs> have infiltrated, you know, every aspect of our lives and, and, um, and our faith communities and the sort of vitriol that we have for each other sometimes, like, you know. It, it, it's harder than it should be, I think, to find a church like that. Um, but they do exist. Um, they are there. And to me, that's kind of the, that's the sweet spot, right? And one more caveat, though, like the church is uh, called by God into community. And the church is a human, uh, is inhabited by humans, right? Unfortunately. <laughs> so that's what I always, I always, I hope none of my parishioners are listening to this, but I always joke about that with my, with my, with my fellow, my pastoral colleagues. I'm always like, ah, why are there all these people in this church? <laughs> <laughs> and you love your people. And I love them church. so much. <laughs> so if you are listening, I love you. <laughs> Truly. Um, but yeah, it's hard, right? P dealing with people is hard. It's yes. Hard. And I, 
and actually what's and and living in the in between is what's really difficult. And because yeah. it's easier as you're talking about the political reality that we're living in, these extremes, uh, it's I think it's almost easier to say, um, as the writer kind of lends itself to this very liberal, uh, vague notion or this very concrete understanding of, you know, rejection. There is something in between. Um, and, mm. and it's not that, you know, it's black, white or gray. There's all areas in between these kind of places. And so um, I think it's important for us to learn to live in uh, between those extremes and to understand each other, books, institutions, people in between kind of these extreme um, narratives that we tend to paint. And hopefully the church can be, with all of its f- flaws, Many <laughs> deep flaws, flaws The church can be one place in our very polarized society where people who disagree can still love one another. Yes. I mean, it's it's what draws the listener back, right? There's something uh, in in all those questions that say, but still, when I read this, but still there are moments when I gather and I feel loved and I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do, right? That is what continues to bring people back to very flawed relationships, right? Flawed institutions, a flawed text. Um, in many ways, right? Um, because of the greater narrative um, that we're talking about of sin and redemption, of love, um, you know, uh, of the good news uh, is is what will always, I think, beckon us um, to try, right? To try to be better right. um, at this right. thing that we're all doing. Yeah, I think I would just, the, the last thing I might leave with the with the listener is it is possible to have questions about the Bible and even have parts that you don't like very much, and to have problems with the church, right? And also to have faith and hope in Jesus Christ, and to have faith and hope that Jesus Christ lived actually for real. He was a real person, and he really did die on the cross, and he really was raised from the dead, and that he entered into, on the cross, entered into precisely this wrestle, the messiness, the pain, the shame, the anxiety, the rejection, the hurt, all of that, and redeemed it by the power of his love and his being raised. And, and if you, if that can be the center, if that can be the center of your faith and your life and what you take away from um, the scripture and your walk with God. That's not vague. That's not, that's a real concrete thing that you can hold on to. And it will stand up to all of the challenges of life. Um, it, 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 it is sturdy. It is sturdy enough to take your, Jesus is sturdy enough to take your questions. He is, he is sturdy enough to take your your pain and your shame and your anxiety and all of that, that's why he did it. And he really did do it. Right. Um, and hopefully that can be the center when we're talking about the two ditches that keeps you in the middle. So, so good. So good. <laughs> yeah. Amen. So anyway, yeah. Amen. well, thank you. Um, thank you both, uh, uh, Jennifer and Catherine for this conversation. And especially again, thank you so much um, to our listener. We are praying for you. Um, we are hoping, uh, we're hoping that, uh, that God will give you peace for those of you who have uh, been listening. Thanks as well. Uh, you can always have more conversations and, and wrestles like this. Uh, if you go to enter the Bible.org where there's, um, resources, commentaries, reflections, conversations, videos, maps, all kinds of stuff. Uh, And of course, uh, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please uh, review us on uh, Apple iTunes, uh, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, share the podcast with a friend. Until next time.